You can go now. Hi, everyone. This is Kathy Lean. Um, I want to make sure you can he all hear my voice. So if you can, please type in yes into the um, Forex Live box. Well, I'm hoping you can. Great. So I want to welcome all of you to our monthly non-farm payrolls preview webinar. Um, sorry I missed last month, but we were traveling for work and so I didn't get a chance to join you, even though it was a very exciting um, non-farm payrolls release. But um, this one should be just as interesting. And I think that you know, given the recent price action, in the markets, um, we could definitely get you know a good sized reaction to the non-farm payrolls report. So, non-farm payrolls is obviously you know the most market moving um, release in the U.S. calendar. And in order to trade non-farm payrolls, we have to get a sense of general market sentiment. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you my screen, and you tell me that if you can see my charts. If you can, then um, then you know we're good to go. Um, Okay, so can you see? Actually, I don't, this is not what I want to share. I want to share actually my com full computer screen. Um, full screen, yeah. Okay, so please confirm to me that you can see my charts. Wonderful. All right, so right now we're just kind of looking at the euro chart and the general price action in the markets. And as you all know, if you've been in any of these webinars and following FX Street and following the markets, is that we've had a complete um, crash in the US dollar over the past 48 hours. So um, the main reason for the move is that traders are waking up to the idea that um, the Federal Reserve is probably not going to raise interest rates in March. Um, previously, everyone was kind of focused on the easing that was happening in, uh, abroad, like from the BOJ, and also um, the talked about easing from the ECB. But no one really gave a second thought to what this means for the Fed, not, you know, the motivation for the easing from these other central banks um, has in terms of the uh, uh, implications for the Federal Reserve. So I think, you know, when uh, Dudley spoke yesterday, he kind of woke everyone up um, from their slumber and said, you know, basically, you know, perhaps the Federal Reserve um, is also um, going to need to rethink their plans for raising interest rates. And that kind of catalyzed uh, catapulted the dollar um, lower. Now, the decline in the dollar was reinforced by actual concrete data, such as, you know, first the ISM non-manufacturing index, and then the um, all of today's releases that confirmed that this is not the right environment for the Federal Reserve to be actively thinking about raising interest rates. Now, we still have six weeks to go to the March meeting, so we're a long ways away, but um, there's certainly um, uh, the the bar is now, has now increased um, significantly for the Federal Reserve's um, rate hike uh, monetary policy decision in March. So that's the environment that we live in right now. Um, also, going into payrolls, we have to understand positioning. Um, before today's move, the latest CFTC report um, showed us that traders were still very, very short euros. They were still very, very short um, uh, pound dollar. But recently we've had, you know, today you're looking at a euro chart with me, we have basically had a 300 point plus squeeze in the euro dollar. So I am certain that um, when we get the CFTC data that covers this period, which unfortunately is not tomorrow's, but the one after, uh, that you'll see that positions have probably been paired significantly. So this is a pretty big deal. Um, we're probably still seeing trade of short euros going into and short pounds going into um, NFPs, which means that there's definitely more vulnerability to a short squeeze, but uh, probably not the same magnitude that you've seen in the past 48 hours because um, because that was basically um, the first leg of the squeeze that was happening. So um, positioning is very important to be cognizant of uh, when we go into the non-farm payrolls release. So let's first start by taking a look at what the market expects for non-farm payrolls. And please confirm to me that you can see my Bloomberg screen because I want to make sure that um, this is operating properly. So can you see my Bloomberg screen? Just say yes to B. 
Perfect. All right. So the market's expecting a soft release. Um, basically, after last month's blowout number, um, the market's looking for significantly um, weaker and job growth from 292,000 to 190,000, so 100,000 less, which you know is a very um, sensible prediction. But where they are looking for strength is in um, average hourly earnings. They're actually looking for wage growth to rise. So um, the room for the surprise is twofold. One is not so much payrolls, because I don't think people are going to pay attention to payrolls all that much unless um, non-farm payrolls exceeds 300,000, which would be another blowout number. And that actually could be significant enough to turn the dollar around. But anything from you know, 260,000 downwards would probably um, either be negative for the dollar if it's, you know, below 200,000 or um, uh, cause a very extremely, extremely limited um, U.S. dollar rally that probably ended up, end up being faded. What matters much more is average hourly earnings and the unemployment rate. If the unemployment rate ticks higher, that's going to wash out everything else and it's going to cause the dollar to fall. Um, if it drops to 4.9%, that's a pretty big psychological level to break below the 5% barrier. And so I think in that case, um, you may see a little bit of a dollar rally, but really the big story is average hourly earnings. If we get, if we do get average hourly earnings um, accelerate, we'll probably see a, um, a stronger dollar rally. But if they, it does does not accelerate and it, it um, either stays flat or only rises 0.1%, um, there, there's uh, probably going to be more pressure on the dollar. We think that the risk is going to be to the downside for non-farm payrolls because first and foremost, the market's bearish um, dollars. We started this talk about with um, saying that they're concerned about um, whether or not the Fed is um, going to raise interest rates in March, and they're expressing their concern by selling dollars. So they already are anticipating a weak release. So if these numbers are soft, it's only going to reinforce their current thinking and accelerate the losses in the greenback. If the data is strong, everyone's going to still eye it with, ca with, uh, with um, caution and say, you know, look, um, the rest of the data, like durable goods, ISMs, um, uh, non-manufacturing is weak, and maybe some of these subcomponents or some components of the labor market report is weak. The Federal Reserve probably is not going to raise interest rates anyway. So at that point, um, it would you know the skepticism of the market would probably end up diminishing the actual impact um, on positive impact on the dollar. The only situation where this could be positive for the dollar is if we get non-farm payrolls um, rising by. 250,000 or more with no major downward revisions to last month's report. The unemployment rate um, holding steady or improving and average hourly earnings growing at 0.3%. And I think you know having all of those stars line up is going to be very, very difficult. And I think that um, it may not be, you know, it's not something that you know we um, anticipate. And one of the main reasons why we don't um, anticipate this is because every month when we... Um, when we kind of uh, look to handicap or think about what we're going to do for non-farm payrolls, we always look at um, you know how other labor market indicators in the U.S. economy um, uh, have changed and what they say about payrolls. So um, there's actually eight pieces of data that we look at, and um, I want to run through them with you. Um, two of them came out today, which is jobless claims and continuing claims. So I'm going to flip over to the historical table of jobless claims. So right now, um, the four-week moving average of jobless claims is at 284,750. We always look at the four-week moving average, not initial claims, because initial claims can be very volatile, whereas the four-week moving average is far less volatile. So the four-week moving average, um, last time non-farm payrolls was released, um, we only had the data from January 2nd. So that rose from 275,000 to 284,000. Um, so the four-week moving average of jobless claims increased, pointing to weaker job growth. But jobless claims um, is not really that big of a deal because, and this deterioration is not that big of a deal because first of all, um, for, because yeah, the bottom line is that it's below 300,000. And as long as it's below 300,000, it's good enough. Um, continuing claims um, also uh, dropped from 2.26 million to 2.25 million. So from that perspective, um, it actually, uh, from that perspective, it actually suggests that 
um, you know, the, the labor market improves. So from a continuing claims perspective and from a four week moving average of jobless claims perspective, um, we're not worried. I wouldn't pay too much attention to these releases because um, I don't think they're going to tell us much um, in regards to the uh, non-farm payrolls report uh, tomorrow. But there are other things that will. So everyone excited about um, ADP yesterday and uh, because ADP came in at 205,000 versus um, a forecast of 195,000. So I mean, that's great. Um, we're happy to see that um, as well. But what we really look at is how it compared to the previous month. The previous month, it was at 267,000. And today, it's at um, 205,000. So this is actually a softer release. So this actually um, goes into the category of favoring weaker payrolls. This morning, we also had um, Challenger Gray and Christmases. Um, uh, lay, layoff report and that showed a 41% increase in layoffs. So if I go to the, my historical table, this is um, the largest increase we've seen in layoffs and the first increase we've seen in layoffs since September. So pretty bad news here in my opinion um, for uh, job growth and this you know also is not very conducive um, for not farm payrolls is an, and is an argument in favor of weaker payrolls. But the two strongest arguments that we have in favor of weaker payrolls is the ISM numbers. So I'm going to pull up the ISM numbers. And I want to show you that um, with the ISM numbers, um, what you see here is that um, with a manufacturing ISM, a manufacturing sector, the employment index went from 48 to 45.9. So that means that um, the manufacturing sector um, continued to lose jobs, which should not surprise anyone because the manufacturing sector has been hit very, very hard by a stronger dollar. So it's not surprising to see that the manufacturing sector experienced greater job losses. The service sector, which is actually the largest component of um, the US economy, um, also experienced significantly slower job growth. The um, employment component went from 56.3 to 52.1. And I do want to show you this table, this chart here that uh, illustrates the relationship. Um, the white line is the employment component of uh, service sector ISM, and the orange line is um, non-farm payrolls. And typically here, for example, so basically the white line comes out first. So in this month, we see this index completely fall, and then you see um, non-farm payrolls fall. Then we see a, a rise, non-farm payroll rises. Here we see the white line rise, non-farm payroll rises. Here we see the white line fall, non-farm payrolls falls. Not 100% perfect correlation, nothing is, but a, certainly a strong enough correlation for us to pay attention to. And given how sharply this index declines, it certainly tells me that non-farm payrolls could be even weaker than um, what the market is looking for. And I think what's even more interesting is that if we go back to the ISM number, so going back to the ISM number, ISM non-manufacturing, let me see if I can find this. So going into the ISM non-manufacturing index, we see that, let me pull up the historical index. So we're looking at this and we're only looking at employment. So the employment index dropped from 56.3 to 52.1. This was the lowest level since January 2015. So it matched the 20, January 2015. And the number, the headline that you see everyone says is the lowest since April 2014, which is correct, but it matched the January 2015 low. And I find the January 2015 low very interesting because that same month it went from 56.2 to 52.1, pretty much the same magnitude decline as today, where it basically went from um, 56.3 to 52.1. So, you know, pretty much equivalent sized moves. And we really haven't seen this type of move, um, this type of size move since uh, February of 2014. So let's take a look at what happened to non-farm payrolls that month. 
So pulling up non-farm payrolls, that month, non-farm payrolls, which was basically 2015, um, dropped from 329,000 all the way down to 201,000. So about 128,000 decline. And, you know, of course, this is not something that we can expect um, all the time to be true. But um, it certainly looks like, you know, this certainly is a big red flag and tells me that, um, you know, we could have a sizable 100,000 drop in non-farm payrolls. Now, the saving grace, of course, is that the market's already looking for a 100,000 drop. But all of this does, you know, tell me that um, we could see a significantly, uh, we could see, you know, a weak non-farm payrolls report, that the chance of it surprising to the upside is very, very low. And there's actually one more set of data that we look at that I want to run you over through is confidence, because confidence is obviously very important. And while we had an improvement, a, you know, a good size improvement in the consumer confidence index, it rose from 96.3 to 98.1. The um, University of Michigan um, index actually declined. The sentiment index went from 92.6, which was the preliminary number, and that was revised down to 92. So University of Michigan basically reported a decline in sentiment. So if you've been following me, um, you will know, um, if you've been following what I've been just saying, um, you will know that... Uh, we've had of the eight leading indicators that we watch for um, non-farm payrolls, six out of the eight uh, point to softer job growth, with the two outliers being continuing claims and consumer confidence. I already showed you how the consumer confidence reading you know, is mixed because one is up, the other one's down. And continuing claims really doesn't matter that much because it's not so much about how uh, many layoffs people are making, but much more about how many hiring um, there is. And um, I think on a lot of uh, corporate sector jobs, the stronger dollar has certainly affected, negatively affected corporate earnings, investment plans, and also the slowdown in um, growth is affecting investment plans. I think all of that is really um, going to hurt, uh, that is really going to hurt um, the uh, market's sentiment. And that's really um, not going to favor a stronger non-farm payrolls report. So all of the leading indicators, the majority of the one that actually matter point to softer payroll growth. So that is why um, if you were going to take a trade um, in non-farm payrolls, probably the best trade would be um, to look for an opportunity to sell dollar yen on rallies. Um, some people like to trade the euro dollar, um, which is interesting. But like, for example, when was the last non-farm payrolls report? Let me see. I think it was on the 4th, is that right? Actually, let me just... Sorry, it was on the 8th. So on the 8th, let's see how the euro dollar performed. So the euro dollar is basically unchanged. So if we go to our granular charts, let me get rid of all of these indicators. And we just flip over to the eighth. That was obviously a very, very strong non-farm payrolls report. And let's see if there was, um, so basically non-farm payrolls increased 292,000 versus 200,000 expected. Average hourly earnings growth slowed. Unemployment rate held steady. So that month, I'm going to marker the NFP report, which is pretty much, a, let me see if I can get to the 15-minute candle and go that far back. Actually, 30-minute candle would be more than sufficient. Just going back to the eighth. All right, so here we go. So this is 8.30, this is the data candle. So data comes out, um, the headline number is strong. Um, so first, your dollar falls, but then it completely, it does what we like to say the V-shaped, the very typical V-shaped reaction to non-farm payroll. So it V's out, um, bottoms, and then ends up higher for the day. Now let's see how dollar yen performed on that very same day. So we're going to January 8th, and we have this release. 
And you can see we had a very strong release, dollar and spike higher and continued lower. Now, if we go back to the euro dollar, and I apologize um, for flipping back and forth, what you will notice is that um, in this case, we do have a very similar reaction where euro dollar just kind of reversed to just um, power it higher for the rest of the session, but sometimes you don't. And I guess that was a poor analogy. But the point I want to make is sometimes your dollar is not the best way to trade um, non-farm payrolls because uh, sometimes you'll have you know one reaction to the headline number and then you'll have another reaction when stocks open and euro trades as a quote unquote risk currency. Dolly on the other hand, you have much purer reaction. Whatever move happens tends to be you know, happen for the rest of the day. But you know, how do you trade not farm payroll? So we talked about maybe one option is perhaps to uh, place an order higher up, see if overnight maybe you can try to sell dollar yen around um, 117.50. If you get that opportunity, that may not be a bad idea, writing it into NFPs. But the smarter way to trade non farm payrolls is to take, um, is to wait for the data to come out and uh, see how the market responds and then trade it. We trade non farm payrolls all the time. And, um, and, we always, uh, our strategies always wait between five to 15 minutes to get laid on. And uh, one thing, one very simple tactic that you could do um, is you basically wait five minutes, establish the high of um, the news candle and uh, the low, you know, five minutes after, and then wait to trade um, the continuation and basically sell it if it breaks um, the low. And you know, take a short-term you know view of maybe 20, 30, 40 pips, and try to ride that afterwards. So this was how you could have traded. This is actually the wrong um, example because that was a 30-minute chart. Let me go to. I don't even know if I can uh, go that far back on my five-minute chart. I can certainly do it in my Bloomberg, but let's take a look. Do do do. Just got a little bit more. Almost there. Here we go. So um, you have the high from the first five minutes, low from the news candle. I can't even see it with my horizontal line. Let me remove that. So low of the news candle, and whoops. And you basically trade this range. Um, and the chat should be up here. And you basically trade the breakdown and you trade the continuation. Let's see if we can look at one more example to see if that happens before. Um, so before that, the release was December 4th. So I'm actually going to use my Bloomberg charts because I think it's a lot easier to go back. So December 4th, dollar yen. Intraday, three days, whoops, not 30, three days, December 3rd, December 5th, sorry about that, um, December 5th, okay, so, Let me annotate this. So 8.30, let's find 8.30. Actually, let me zoom in. Okay, here we go. 8.30. It's pretty much right here. So this is the 830 candle. And um, so basically what you could do is isolate the high of the candle. And let me just make sure these are five, these are one minute candles. So, but anyway, that would be the high because this is 830. Actually, no. 32, 830. Okay, so the high of the candle is actually over here. And then um, the low 10 minutes later, which is 840, 
is somewhere right over here. So the low will basically be this low here. So the low with this candle is one, let's say about 123.07. So that's the low, 123.07. You can basically sell maybe 0405, and this went all the way down to 122. Um, it looks like 87. So if you want, you know, that was a 20 pip move. It wasn't a huge move, but um, you still could have maybe scalped it for a little bit. And that was probably not a huge surprise, not from payrolls like the one we just had. But either way, um, the point that I want to make is that um, it pays to wait when it comes to non-farm payrolls and wait to trade the data after the release. Um, it's probably the smarter trade to move to to do. But either way, um, the best pair to trade is um, dollar yen because it should have the cleanest uh, reaction to non-farm payrolls. Okay, so now I'd like to open up the floor to any questions you may have um, about uh, tomorrow's release. And I already answered Fabian's question about which pair will be trading. Any questions? Feel free to pop in with any questions. If you don't have any questions, that's fine. I'm happy to uh, have had you um, in the room today to listen to NFPs. And if you want to follow me on, you know, NFP day tomorrow, you can always hit me up on Kathy Lean FX. That's my Twitter handle. Um, you can always, you know, get my latest insights there. So I do ADP was pretty good, but dollar remained weak, so no rates priced in. Well, we looked at that pan. We looked at how ADP was good, but the problem was that ADP still represented a decline from the previous month. So it just wasn't good enough. What are reactions do you expect from your dollar based on the possible scenarios for NFPs? Well, with regards to euro, um, what we have to recognize is that, um, let me pull back my other charts that I usually look at. Let me go back to the euro. Um, and let me show you kind of the FIB levels that you need to be aware of. Actually not there, let's see, right there. Okay, so the FIB levels is a sh shorter term FIB, but the FIB levels need to be aware of. The FIBs are right above 113, so that's something important to pay attention to. But we're expecting weaker payrolls, so um, maybe buying euro on dip may not be a terrible idea. But once again, it's euro trading euro is confusing because um, you know weaker US data could mean more ECB easing. So I think the purest trade is really dollar yen. Expecting no rate rise, what will be more important? Well, I mean, average hourly earnings is the most important part of the release. Whom institution creating spikes on NFPs? Um, that's a really vague currency copy co question. Um, you know, a lot of institutions are in play. I think it's a lot of speculators just kind of adjusting positions, getting in and out um, off of NFPs. And so it's not really um, any specific institutions I could name. But a lot of them are, um, you know, large players. Any other questions?
All right, so if there's no additional questions, I'd like to thank all of you for participating today. And um, is the behavior when a good number of release always act the same way? Um, not always, because it really, I mean, because nonprofit payrolls has so many subcomponents like revisions, unemployment rates, um, average hourly earnings, you don't always get the same reaction because you may not always have the same scenario this thing improving, the other one weakening, or the all, the all improving, and so forth. Um, DZ, you could trade euro um, off of NFPs, but we prefer um, dollar yen uh, because it has the purest re reaction. When do I see euro dollar go back, going back to 106? Um, it's a far fetched call. You know, I really don't. I think you'll be lucky. I mean, I think it will go back to 109, but uh, and maybe even 108. But 106 is seems like a stretch right now. Any other questions? All right. If and there are no additional questions, thank you so much for joining me, and good luck trading NFPs. Oh, here's a question for Rusty. Why do traders go to the yen when they're panicking for comfort? That's a very good question. They don't go to the yen when they're panicking for comfort. What they're doing is that the yen is a favorite funding currency. So a lot of people have sold short yens in order to buy other currencies. So what they're doing is that they're buying, they're closing, um, like maybe their, um, their uh, long uh, Australian dollar trade and buying back the yen. So it's more like they are um, exiting out of their positions rather than going to the yen for comfort. Okay, thank you so much, guys. You've been a great audience, and I will see you next month, or I will see you regularly um, on Twitter at Kathy Lean FX. Thank you so much. Have a great day.